across the UK, Wales is the country with the least, the lowest level of regular church attendance. Now, you wouldn't think that, would you? People don't think that of Wales. But this is the country with the lowest level of church attendance. 12% in Wales, England 14%, Scotland 18 London 22 Northern Ireland 45 It's not a good situation in Wales, and it's a declining situation in terms of attendance in Wales. In fact, it's the atheist Julian Beghini who's the one who's come out and said, probably you'll find that committed Christians are the ones who will object most strongly to the country being described as a Christian country. How are you going to decide if Britain's a Christian country? You could say on the four side, you look at the Constitution and say there are Christian principles involved in the Constitution. You could say there are Christian principles underlying many of the laws. These are historical considerations. You could say the culture reflects Christian faith, so you know, the faith that we haven't got is the Christian faith, is Christianity. Uh, that's, that's probably, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. Census data still say that sort of 50 odd percent of people are attending or whatever it may be. But then there's the other side. And the other side is saying, well, church attendance is really low, actually. Legal changes are taking place in our country that really militate against being a Christian, make it difficult to be a Christian in many jobs and are requiring people to, to give up important parts of their faith by law. So that's against. Culture, well there are elements there, against. The census data, well you could argue that for or against. And of course we come back to this big consideration which comes from those who do believe their Bible, which says that countries can't be Christians, people become Christians. The problem we've got, it seems to me, as, as believers with this, is the problem of humanistic, inverted commas, Christianity. Okay, public square voices, time and again, are turning Christianity into a set of actually, not Christian, but humanist values. What's humanism? Humanism says this life is the only life we have, that the universe is a natural phenomenon, no supernatural side, that we can live ethical, fulfilling lives on the basis of reason and humanity. Human welfare and happiness at the centre of ethical decision making, with all the problems that brings with it. Relativist values. And more and more we've got these people speaking for the church who are taking relativist values and saying, well, that's Christianity. So Dominic Grieve, the Attorney General, and he's in charge, he's the government's chief law officer, so we have got a problem. <clears throat> He's saying that atheists who claim Britain's a Christian country are deluding, are deluding are no longer a Christian country, are deluding themselves. But he says Christians are increasingly reluctant to express their religious views because they're being turned off by the disturbing and very damaging rise of religious fundamentalism. And by religious fundamentalist, he means people like me. He says that's a bad thing and it's breaking society up. So of course we're a Christian country, but then he's adopting the atheist thing, that this is a bad influence in society. That is why he says those with softer religious views find it disturbing, say they don't want anything to do with it, by which he means Christianity. Ian Duncan Smith has picked up on this very similarly. It is arguably our Christian heritage, listen very carefully to this, it is arguably our Christian heritage with its innate tolerance and inclusivity that has ensured the freedom of all voices, religious or non-religious, to be heard and be valued. That is just total relativism. It is not Christianity at all. It is saying that Christianity has this innate tolerance and inclusivity. And it doesn't. Jesus doesn't. He says you need to repent or you'll be uh, outside the kingdom of God. There are clergy in the media all the time who've swapped out the theology of the kingdom of God with the philosophy and the politics of the nations of mankind. So Giles Fraser, you'll have heard of him on the radio and so on. He writes a regular column in The Guardian called Loose, Col Loose Cannon, because he's a canon in the Anglican Church. Um, you know, he's identifying radical Christianity with actually radical relativism all the time. So you've got uh, Cameron doing his thing, then you've got the 50 atheists protesting, and now there's been a group of academic philosophers who come in on this 
secular humanistic Christianity side of things, saying, yes, of course we are. British culture is still infused with Christianity. And I'm beginning to think the word they should have used was confused. Nick Clegg has given us the biggest howler of the lot. Here it comes. Nick Clegg, an unbeliever, who, uh, an avowed atheist, who does go to church, <laughs> which is interesting. He's the only one that, of these that seems to. Um, he chimed in on the Anglican side of the argument, and this is his quote. One of the great Christian values is tolerance, respect for other people, other nations, other faiths, other views. So I think our Christian heritage sits very comfortably alongside our plurality, by which he means pluralism, our tolerance as a people. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there it is, you know, it's a complete picture of relativism being presented as, as Christianity. Now, this is interesting because Jesus is, is having to deal with a situation very, very like that. When Jesus turns up on the scene in Mark chapter 1 and starts preaching biblical Christianity, he's dealing with a country where the politicians have taken over the religious side of life, where the religious side of life has been subverted by people who are really trying to use it for their own purposes. So you've got the, the, the sort of Sadducees and the temple elites and, and they are taking anything supernatural out of things at all because they are running quite a nice profitable operation at the temple. They don't want anything disturbed. And, and then you've got the Pharisees who are trying to be popularists, but they've sort of developed an awful lot of their own teachings around the Jewish faith. And they're running it like that because they're trying to have a national religion in the place which serves their political purposes. Jesus comes on to just such a stage as that. A state church that he has to deal with. So how does he set out his prime concerns? How do you set out how you deal with that situation? Well, John was imprisoned. Jesus went into Galilee, which is interesting, proclaimed the gospel of God. And he said, the time's fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. You're getting it all wrong. He is coming and bringing a competing message against that state church background. And then he calls these two groups of fishermen with the effects of which we know. So here's Jesus' challenge to first century Palestine, a theoretically religious but actually quite secular state where religion was being used for political purposes. And he debunks the politics of mankind and centers on the kingdom of God. Here's the big issue for Jesus. Here's the big point at which the proclamation takes off. Something is happening. Something has changed. The kingdom of God, the Basileia Tutha'u, the kingship of God has arrived. Jesus went out into Galilee and he preached the good news, the gospel of God. The gospel of it's good news that he preaches. Now, we're up against this all the time at the moment, and we've had it with this issue again, with atheists, with secularists, with people who want to claim Christianity for themselves but should not, saying that a biblical approach to life is actually a bad thing and it's divisive and nasty for society. And Jesus says, no, actually, this is good news for you. This is good news. It's good news that I preach. Please notice, first and foremost, Jesus doesn't then come with a wet and woolly ethos. He founds his kingdom on a challenging message. It is a message that he brings. And the context and the process and the content are excruciatingly clearly described. So, the message. After John was in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaimed the gospel of God. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. There's the message. It arrives in a context, and the context is spelled out. It's the one in which John the Baptist has been sent to this religiously confused state with its politically compromised establishment religion and its political manipulators of the state religion. And in fulfillment of centuries of Old Testament prophecy about God sending a saviour back, he says the kingdom of God has arrived. Too often, you know, we measure the Bible by our weaknesses, not our weaknesses by the Bible. 
And that's what had been going on, and that's what's going on for us today, perhaps. We measure the Bible by our weaknesses and whether we're prepared to live with that, given our weaknesses, rather than measuring our weaknesses according to what God says in the book. It's a message you may think applies to our generation. John's role as a prophet was to call people out of their religious complacency and back to lives lived in actual obedience, actual acknowledgement of God. The rights of the Creator are being reclaimed. That's the stuff about preaching the kingdom of God is right. The Creator is coming back to reclaim his position. And for all their woolly lip service to religion, the political leaders of the day lived immoral and brutal lives around John. And for his pains, they chopped off faithful John's head because he challenged their relativism. Incidentally, you know, we think of having a significant death. Perhaps you want to have a significant death. You don't have an insignificant death. Do you? John the Baptist is the one who's said to be the greatest born of woman, greatest man born of woman, John the Baptist. And they chopped off his head to pay a lap dancer. None of us is guaranteed a significant death. Not even the greatest man born amongst women. John's in prison. The verb means handed over, delivered up. It's a word that will later be used of Jesus. And at that point, Jesus goes off into Galilee. Galilee. He, um, <clears throat> John had been down in the desert. You had to go out of your way to get to John. Jesus goes where there's lots of people. He goes to the thriving place, to Galilee. Here's, here's the process then. There's the context, John the Baptist being handed over. The process goes like this. John operating in the hot desert down the south, fords of the Jordan. You had to go out to see him, not so with Jesus. He went where there were people, to economically far more active Galilee. Galilee, not the thriving religious hub of, of Jerusalem and Judea, but to the near pagan people of the north. To the traders, to the materially minded people in its busiest industry, the fishing industry. It was a huge industry, Josephus talks about it. Without time or resources for the religion of the theocrats. And when he went there, he proclaimed, that was an important part of the process, he proclaimed the good news of God. That's the process. So the context is one we've seen. The process is as we've described it. Now the content. The gospel. Good news. No doubt Jesus has got in mind Isaiah 52 7, you know, where it says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news. Proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. We don't proclaim ethics, we proclaim salvation, as prophesied by Isaiah, as embodied by Jesus at the heart of his ministry. Jesus is proclaiming the imminent kingdom of God. And as the turning point in pushing suffering causing sin out of the cosmos, that's very good news indeed. Because sin causes suffering and pain. And the content of that good news goes like this. The time is fulfilled. That's your lot. Or better still, the appointed long-awaited time has arrived. It's an announcement, announcement of the decisive moment. This is it! <coughs> now, no, we... You know, the Christian message comes with, hey, this is it now. Now. And the reason for that is it's only good news if it arrives in time, yeah? The era of fulfillment has arrived. It will call for decisive responses from God's people. God is retrieving his authority. The time is up. The kingship of God is coming in. God is retrieving his authority, which has been wrested from him by human beings. The time is up. God is having his authority back. Now here's the radical action you need to take. In the light of the fact of what is happening here, you need to repent and believe the message of the gospel. Is that confusing in any sense? Mona D. Hooker, who I love to quote from her commentary on Mark's gospel. Fantastic name. Mona says... This is the good news from God. Repent and believe. Now who would have thought that? That's a bit of a shock to our sort of cultural way of seeing things, isn't it? Here's good news. Great, excellent, thank you. Repent and believe. What? <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. 
Our sinful human nature has got its hooks into us so deep that we can't see that as good news to start with. It's like a bridge you see better looking backwards after you've crossed it. Metanoite kai pistuete into euangelio. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now those, are, those things are a million miles from the inclusiveness and tolerance being claimed now as the essential values of Christianity. They're urgent imperatives. They're not inclusive. And they're certainly not tolerant of sin or other ways. That's the good news of God. But, as Dick France points out, both verbs and their cognate nouns occur frequently throughout the New Testament to denote the basis of discipleship. This is what Christian discipleship is, says Dick. And they're quoted again and again as the basis of being a Christian. And they're brought together for that purpose in Acts 20:21, 20, where Paul is summing up his ministry uh, for, for the Ephesian elders. He's going off to Jerusalem and he's going off to die, going off to Rome to die. Paul sent out for Ephesus, he calls the elders of the church and he sums up his ministry and he wants to leave them with something that will really help them to persist and be faithful in Ephesus. I have declared, he says, Acts 20:21, 20, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And that's what he needs to impress on them as his parting shot. Repent, metanoeo. He translates a Hebrew word in, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew word would be shub, which expresses the same demand for a living a radically new direction of life. This is the good news. Repent and believe. Trust more than intellectual assent to a mere principle. These guys have got it wrong. Placing trust in the message of truth, the message of Jesus itself. Repent and believe this good news. It's the focus of Jesus' ministry. It is the essence of what is said to us about what a Christian is, what a disciple of Christ is about. And having spelled out for us at the beginning of his gospel what this good news is, Mark doesn't return to that again. He has told you. It just says they preach the gospel to them. This is the archetypal, essential primary message this is it this is the Christian faith it's been spelled out Mark doesn't come back to it again well if that's what being a Christian is there never was a Christian country on any definition the saviour could recognise was there neither was first century Palestine a state following God. These verses were written precisely for times like these. The message is, it's time to repent and believe. Now, when this all came out about the, the, um, the comments that Cameron made and uh, the letter from the atheists and stuff, the BBC reported, and then they, they started to break into a bit of a sweat on it by Monday morning. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Ross Atkins from the BBC was obviously trying to work out what they were going to do, where they were going to go with their reporting. And sometimes they do this. They throw out a tweet to see where opinion lies. And uh, he tweeted this. David Cameron says UK is a Christian country, in inverted commas. Now dozens of public figures are saying that is wrong. Do you agree? Here's his focus group, so I'm joining it. So, so I just tweeted back quickly. I just said, um, a Christian is a person who's acted on Christ's call to turn from sin and follow him. So what do you think? Funnily enough, my phone didn't ring. Funnily enough, I didn't get quoted anywhere. Not that I know of. Because to woolly liberalism, this is a threat, you see. This message is a threat. But to disciples of Christ, days like these are actually not a threat, but an opportunity. The ball has been thrown in the air and it's our opportunity to swing the bat. Dr. Russell Moore is, is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. So he's a big cheese in perhaps the biggest 
Christian denomination in America, the evangelical-ish one. He says he's not worried about the decline in numbers, saying that the current membership reflected a more authentic Christianity. Less, but truer. I think, he says, what we're seeing is the collapse of a cultural nominal form of Christianity. There was a time in America where in order to be a good person, to be seen as a good citizen, one had to be, nominally at least, to be a member of a church. Those days are over, he says. We're at a point now where Christianity is able to be authentic. And he went on and he said, it offers an opportunity for the church to speak clearly, articulately, about what it is that we believe. And Jesus is coming in and clearing it up. He's got this religious state and it's all to chips. And here's his response to that. The content of Christianity is exclusively conveyed here by proclaiming that the time is fulfilled. God has said about calling mankind to account for the rebellion against him. The kingdom of God is right near. So here is what you must do. You must repent and you must put your trust in this gospel message of how Christ saves you. That's the Christian message. And our politicians and our churchmen don't seem to know that, which is kind of worrying. But there it is, right at the start of Mark's The Easiest of Gospels, the easy-peasy one. And it's playing across the face of that most straightforward of Gospels. You won't get it on the te telly. You won't get in the papers with that one. They'll edit you out. You will need to get it out at the grassroots. From mouth to ear, from hand to hand. Because the powers that be totally control the means of mass communication about these things. And as ever, they will not tolerate this message. It's got to go hand to hand. It's got to go, follow me then, and I will make you fishers of men, because it ain't going out on the telly. Does that make sense? Faithful followers is the strategy. That's exactly where Jesus takes us next, actually. The resilient way, the powers that be proof way, that he plans to communicate his message. Faithful followers will be resilient tellers of his truth. And the effects of the fall will be undone as repentance and faith then spring up on the earth. The governing liberal consensus of his day and of ours is subverted by those means. Because they'll strangle you out otherwise. There's the message. So now as I've said, here comes its crystal clear out working in practice then. If that's the message, here's the call to the method that will take it out. Verses 16 to 20 of Mark 1. Simon and Andrew, as he went along the sea of Galilee, saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea. They were quite busy. They had plenty on. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, I'll turn you into fishers of people. They left the nets immediately and they followed him. That's how it works. Now this is odd, and it strikes me as odd like this. Okay, so here comes Jesus, he bursts on the scene, he says, the kingdom of God is bursting in. Hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecy and the undoing of the fall has been announced. It's happening here. And the next thing you hear is he goes along the beach, goes for a stroll along the beach, and he found some socially insignificant people, just ordinary craftsmen, you know, running their little business. And he says, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And you're expecting something cataclysmic to break across the sky. And he finds Simon and, and Andrew, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. The parable of the mustard seed clearly applies in the plans and purposes of God, doesn't it? But Jesus finds Simon and Andrew in Galilee. Industrial, much despised north, where the people's pedigree wasn't pure as far as the, the purest down in Jerusalem were concerned, and the intellectuals had all left for jobs in the city. <laughs> but to see a Galilee teamed with fish fish of all sorts and they were processed and they were transported along the trade routes out into the wider Roman Empire. It was a great source of protein, much prized. And the Romans and the Herodian vassals taxed that trade heavily. And Jesus went there. Josephus describes fish being found there which were not to be found elsewhere. And there were plenty of fishing villages all around the west and northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. 
Jesus went where those people were, where these fish made a great deal of export-driven income. As business was good, as the protein was valued, and as the lake was teeming with these fish, it really was. It made hard work, but it raked in the money. And Simon and Andrew were such hard, danger-dicing, laboring men. He went to these tough guys. And Jesus seems to be asking them for something quite ridiculous. As he went along the Sea of Galilee, he saw these guys casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen, way outside the institutions of power. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll turn you into fishers of people. What sort of, what sort of harebrained scheme is this? First you follow Jesus, secondly he makes you people fishers. It even sounds daft. Dafter when you grasp at the cultural context, context against which Jesus is issuing that call. First place, the call is to following. What he says here is, come behind me. Work behind me. Now I remember as, as a little lad working with elderly relatives in the valleys and stuff. And they say, they'd be in the allotment or they'd be, you know, chopping their way through the grave for Palm Sunday through all the overgrowth, right? And they'd be, come behind me. Work behind me. And that was the way that generations of people were trained to do the practical things that they do for the rest of their lives. Let the little fella come behind me and learn. He'll see out the plant beans. Come behind me and put them in there. There you are, look. See. Come behind me with that secateurs or hook and just work your way through to the old grave. And I'll do the bulk of the work out in front. You come behind me and pick up and learn. It's, it's just that. He's saying, come after me. Disciples, not equals, but learners. This is not rabbinic discipleship. This is far more radical than that. This isn't just learning how to interpret the law. They're not being called to devote their lives to, to some training thing, and then they'll be experts and all. They're being called to devote their whole lives now to follow Jesus as their leader in a relationship that goes far beyond intellectual learning of theories into full-time apprenticeship of life. It's a call that marks Jesus out far more as a prophet than as a rabbi. It's far more radical and extreme than that. It's a call to do that, and in the second place, the call is to fishing for people. In our culture, the secularists kind of bully us into thinking the decent thing, the proper thing, the moral thing is to keep your beliefs to yourself. Have you noticed that? You're allowed your own opinions, but don't, tell me, don't bother me with them. The loving thing biblically is actually to spread the good news because sin is serious and God's kingdom is coming in. And you see that amongst Christian ministers and people who have been set apart for this gospel. People do really need to repent and they really do need to believe the gospel. But most ministers have stopped being fishers of men and become caretakers of the fish tank. And that's crazy. The world around us, the, the 50 atheists who sign the letter, I'm sure they're happy for us to be curators of the fish tank. That's not the call of Jesus. That's not what Christianity is about. Hence the call to repentance. It's because Jesus has come. He's going to root out rebellion. And that all this repenting and believing is necessary. It is urgent. That's what's entailed in Christianity. So often our Christianity, in inverted commas, doesn't equal discipleship. His does. Given what he said in the last seven days, I want to know if the PM and all his cronies who've been chipping in on this are up for that. I expect he's busy. But don't you realise in their way so were Simon and Andrew? And yet their response is utterly riveting. They left their nets. They left this good thing they got going on. There's nothing wrong with being a fisherman. There was a lot that was good about it because it was quite profitable. They left their net. They did it immediately. 
And they went off to follow a wandering preacher who, who really hadn't got his degree in even, you know. So urgent is and compelling is the call from the Lord that all previous calls on their lives lose their validity. That is Christianity. That is what Mark is showing us at the outset of his gospel. That is what Christianity is. He takes precedence over livelihood and family. There is commitment in a real trust in a dangerous looking Jesus. Dominic Grieve and the letters that he's written and so on, they, do, they just don't grasp that. Even Duncan Smith, he hasn't got hold of that. They embrace this real risk of trusting Christ. That's what Christianity is. And family and property and business all shrink back in significance as they commit themselves to following Christ. That is not humanistic religion, that is biblical Christianity. And there is a world between the two. In fact, the threat to biblical Christianity comes not so much from the atheists as from humanistic Christianity, which has soaked up the values of relativism, but it's pretending there's something else. Its urgency, this biblical Christianity's urgency, is rooted in the authority of the person who calls them. Jesus walks by the beach and he says to these guys, you can reckon they will know their own mind, okay? He says to them, you follow me. And they do. What do you think their nets were worth to them? Quite a few, Bob. What do you think Peter's wife, kids, mother-in-law were likely to say about all this? <laughs> Andrew too for that matter. There was going to be a domestic that evening, wasn't there? They left them. Following Jesus means there are good things that you leave as well as bad things that you repent of. Ooh. That sounds a bit extreme. That's what's putting people off Christianity. No, no, that is Christianity. These fishermen were wise enough to know to act on that and to act on it without prevarication. And they left their nets and they did it immediately. And then decisively we read they followed after Jesus. Is it because they're a few bunch of crackpot, you know, Loopy loopies. Is that, what's, is that the situation? No, because going a little bit further down the beach, Jesus saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in their boat mending nets. B bigger firm now. This is Zebedee and sons, okay? And you can tell it's a bigger firm because they have hired men. This is quite a firm. Uh, uh, and he immediately, Jesus called those guys from their much more affluent business. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. What's being exhibited to us here is the essential elements in Christian discipleship. The relationship with Jesus, the active promotion of his mission, and the total commitment to his cause. So let's come back to the question. Is Britain, is Wales a Christian country? No, it never was. But it is increasingly Christianity that's the religion that people don't really have. We need to stress in a world like this that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Christian who follows the Christ that the, the documents that record his life tell us about. Because there is no source for Christianity outside these documents. And these documents tell us Christianity is something very radically different from what's being represented to us. Here it comes. The kingdom of God is at hand. Whoa. Repent and believe the good news, the message that Jesus brings. What does it bring with it? 
it brings necessarily with it this commitment of life to follow him. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And to do that, they left good things as well as repenting of the sin that was theirs. And they followed Jesus in his way.